Happy New Year, everyone. It's early January 2015, and my guest this week is Michael Tonsmeyer, a.k.a. the Mad Fermentationist, sharing his secret tips from top brewers. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're now offering a full six issues a year, up from four at a great discount. They're offering a new discount code now, which gives you 15% off everything they sell in their store, including subscriptions and training. The new code is Beersmith2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for homebrewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code Beersmith2015 to get your 15% discount today. Finally, I encourage you to check out Beersmith, available from beersmith.com. You can take a test drive of the desktop version for 21 days by downloading the free trial from beersmith.com. And also we have extensive tutorials, including our huge recipe site and mobile version integration. You can find out more about these by watching the videos at beersmith.com video. Grab your copy of Beersmith today from beersmith.com and brew your best beer ever. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Tonsmeyer, the author of the recent book, American Sour Beers. He's also a beer designer for the Modern Times Craft Brewery and author of the Mad Fermentationist blog at themadfermentationist.com. Michael's been on the show four times before, most recently in episode number 85, discussing sour beers. Michael, it's uh, great to have you back. It's always fun to be on your show, Brad. So uh, what have you been up to since I saw you last summer? Uh, you, you had just released your sour beer book at that time. Uh, for, for the most part, I've been enjoying my weekends. It's, it's been great not having uh, you know seven or eight hours of reading and research and editing and uh, citations to do every weekend like I was while the book was in full swing. <laughs> um, so I've, I was at it Modern Times again for a week this summer, and we just actually recently released our first set of six barrel-aged sour beers. I got one empty hats oh, in my hand right cool. here. Um, and so those were brewed uh, when I was out there the summer before, and they're getting great reviews, and people are loving them, and, and I've been really happy with the way uh, they turned out thanks to the, the the real brewers out there who did all the work of brewing and blending and bottling and all that. So that's the uh, Modern Times Brewery. I just brought it up here. at uh, It's in Point Loma, right? Exactly. And I, I believe some of the sours are actually still available in bottles at the brewery, uh, at the tasting room, if, if anyone wants to run over there in the next uh, couple of weeks. But there's plenty more in the barrels, and there'll be, there'll be more where that came from uh, not too long. Fantastic. And the book's selling well, too, I assume. Yeah, it's, it's been selling fantastic. The, the reviews on Amazon have been terrific and out of control. And the, there's so far, I have 43 reviews. There's one sub five star review, and that one refers to it as a great book. I think so. It's a uh, real, really uh, uh, been wonderful to see. You know that thing that I had in my hands and was staring at. You know, 20 hours a week actually turned into something. Pulled, that, pulled that up here. It's uh, American Sour Beers. Uh, right now, it's on Amazon for ten dollars. Pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy um, how how little books sell for. And yeah, it's either Kindle <laughs> or. Uh, or uh, paperback. So uh, go go out and get uh, another copy if you only have one. Yeah, we uh, we covered that back in I can't remember what episode. I think it was that last episode you were on. It was that like number eighty five or something. I like think that. so. That that was uh, maybe a month after it came out. I think. Right. Right. So your uh, your blog, the Mad Fermentationist, has become quite popular, and you recently put together a post on uh, secrets of the best brewers. So uh, uh, tell me a little bit about the origins of that post. Sure. This is actually this is uh, I've been writing a lot of articles for uh, Brew Your Own Magazine, and this was one that I I had sort of thought about uh, for them, and I pitched it to them, and they sort of said, "Well, you know, maybe, maybe that's not you know uh, something we we want to do." So I said, "Fine, I'll just do it for the blog." It's a great thing about having a blog is you can just throw uh, trimmings from. Uh, magazine posts or books or whatever up on there and, and see what sort of response they get. Um, but this one was sort of a follow-up. I've done a couple of posts on maybe, you know, tips that new brewers could really take advantage of. You know, just very simple things, um, make, making sure you have healthy yeast, making sure your uh, pitching temperature and fermentation temperature are on target, um, and then maybe some more advanced things that you might want to look at. Um, but this was really one that is sort of looking at those the very sort of the the upper echelon of breweries, not just you know a, a an average mediocre brew pub that that might be around the corner, but these are you know uh, the Hill Farmsteads and the uh, the Three Floyds and the 
uh, societies out in California, the really sort of terrific craft breweries, and trying to trying to think about not not sort of the little tips and secrets for a particular beer, not, oh, you know, my secret for the blonde ale is I add 2% crystal 90, and that gives it just a little hint of roast or something. Mm -hmm. uh, more the conceptual differences. What really sets these breweries apart from the breweries and from the home brewers who, who brew good beer and, and maybe occasionally a, a very good beer, but by and large don't brew something that would be called world-class or fantastic or the sort of beer that you drink and you go, wow, I've, I've never had a beer like that. I've never tasted that flavor. I've never had um, that, that balance or that freshness in the hop aroma or those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought maybe we just uh, walk through some of those secrets if you want to start out with uh, secret number one. Sure. Um, so the, the first one is really the importance of developing your palate. Um, it's very difficult. It's probably impossible to be a really terrific brewer without being a terrific beer drinker. Um, and I'm not talking about someone who has had the most beers. I'm not talking about someone who goes to a beer festival and goes through a hundred different samples and can say, sure, I've had this. I have a list of them. Um, for me, I, I love beer festivals. I love going to the Great American Beer Festival. Mm -hmm. I love going to the, the terrific beer advocate festivals up in Boston. Um, the problem with a lot of those is by the time you've had 5, 10, 15, 20 one-ounce pours, how much are you really getting out of that next small amount of beer, particularly if it's a subtle beer, particularly, you know, you're not, you're not getting a lot of, uh, out of a Pilsner after you just had that 14% alcohol mm -hmm. uh, double imperial stout or whatever. Um, and so I think so much of, of developing your palate is drinking really great beer in the best possible condition. Um, and ideally under circumstances where you're drinking with other people who have great palates or even, I mean, at the brewery where you can maybe find out what went into that beer, what, you know, what yeast they used, what hops are in there, um, to really develop that sense of not only how a beer tastes, but what went into making taste, what went into making it taste the way it tastes. Um, so I, I would say, you know, Get a core group of friends. Um, I, I know I have a bunch of friends around mm -hmm. here who every few weeks will get together and people will bring um, certainly beers they homebrewed, but also you know, beers they traded for, beers they picked up while they were traveling. And we'll have a nice, long, leisurely tasting session. Um, we'll talk about the beers. We'll, you know, particularly when you're talking to other really talented brewers or home brewers, they can really tell you exactly what went into that beer. They can tell you, you know, and, and most brewers and home brewers, when you get them talking, are happy to share sort of those basic recipe details or process details or um, tips and tricks that they have. And I, I think those are all really important mm -hmm. in developing as a great brewer. Well, uh, in our video series that John Palmer and I did, we had a whole chapter on judging beer. And you know, John and I noticed that some of the best beer judges are also some of the best home brewers. Oh, I mean, can't, can't argue with that. I mean, so much of what beer judging is, is sitting around really focusing on a beer and really challenging your palate because it, whether it's positive or negative, you don't know what's in that beer. You know, you're presented with a with a dark brown beer. It's it's called the robust porter, and you have to tease out really by flavor and sight alone um, and aroma what what went into this. Is this a good porter? Um, my only sort of complaint about the BJCP is there's a real focus on detecting off flavors, and yeah. that is really crucial early on in your brewing career, learning how to brew a beer that isn't full of diacetyl or acetaldehyde, that doesn't have fusel alcohols. Um, but as you get to be a better and a better and a better brewer, there's this sort of additional level of not only making a beer that's free of off flavors, you can have a beer that's free of off flavors and still only scores a, a 35 out of 50 at a BJCP competition. You, at a certain point, you need those um, intangibles. You need that, that interest. You know, if you're brewing a porter, Sure, you can have you know a little coffee, a little chocolate, but getting a really great dark chocolate varietal flavor that um, you know balances the, those uh, rich multi flavors with just the right hop, and maybe a subtle hopping with uh, something with a little citrus in it that's going to uh, really make that chocolate flavor pop, and that's sort of that additional level that that I think is very often difficult to get from beer judging experience mm -hmm. because you don't know exactly what those people add to those beers. You know, you, you can score and you can say this is transcendent. This is the best porter I've ever had. But then you don't get the cheat sheet at the end that says, oh, this is what was added. These are the malts or these are the hops or this is the water pH that uh, the mash pH or the final pH they were going for or 
Um, I, I think that's that's sort of tricky. And and to me, a lot of the best beers aren't necessarily brewed right to style. Um, there's nothing wrong with brewing a an ESB or uh, an American IPA right in the middle of the style, and that's a great way to win competitions is to really hit the meaty part of it. But a lot of the best beers out there were originally brewed for their own sake. They they weren't brewed to a guideline. They weren't brewed to um, anything but the brewer's taste. And in a lot of cases, those styles sort of grew up around them. So, you know, you look at something like the Flemish Reds. Those were beers long before Flemish Red was a, was a term that Michael Jackson came up with in the 1970s. Um, but Rodenbach and a lot of those beers existed for a long time before mm-hmm. that. And then someone came along and said, okay, you know, I'm going to identify these beers. Um, and so I, I think a, a lot of brewers may spend a little bit too much time, um, particularly home brewers. Craft brewers seem to be a little bit more uh, – their, their competitions tend to be a little less reliant on the style guidelines. While they have styles, they're often given a little more leeway. Um, where I've judged a lot of BJCP competitions where, you know, something gets really hammered for being, you know, too dark or a little too hoppy for the style or something like that. Um, and so I'd say ju- beer jugging is an essential piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. Right. Um, well, let's move on to your to your next point. Uh, I think we're on the second one now. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, it sort of goes hand in hand with that. It's finding your own flavor combinations. There's nothing wrong, and I certainly, I mean, if you go back through the, the eight years of, of uh, archives on my blog, I brewed a lot of clones. I brewed a lot of, you know, hey, I, I've heard great things about this beer, or I had this beer once while I was on vacation in San Francisco. I, I had Russian River Supplication. I'm going to try to brew something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And that, that, again, is a great way to start out. It's a great way to learn about, you know, to, to test your brewing skill, to take a list of ingredients or a set of parameters or flavors and try to hit them. Um, but I, I just don't think that that's the way it seems like a lot of really terrific brewers eventually find their own brewing voice. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, taking, say, Pliny the Elder, uh, the terrific uh, double IPA from Russian River, and brewing it once as is, and then going, okay, you know, I really like it like that, but, you know, how would it be with, you know, a bunch of hops that, you know, aren't in there? Maybe I want to use something like Citra or, uh, you know, maybe something really fruity like uh, Motueka or Nelson Savin from New Zealand. Um, and then sort of taking it off on your own direction and figuring out what works for your palate best. Is it, you know, is that original recipe, you know, it's, it's perfect for those brewers, but is it perfect for you? Um, and I'm not, you know, obviously talking about doing necessarily weird, wild, crazy, you know, not a peanut butter marshmallow stout or something like that, but tweaking, finding your own, your own voice, um, you know, playing with the ingredients, the hops that you can get your hands on and figure out in what way those ingredients can be used to make the best beer. Excellent um, point. Um, where do you go to find inspiration for, for new ideas, uh, new beers? Oh man, all over the place. I mean, obviously, commercial beers, other other home brews are sort of the the first place to look, um, just because they have you know their beers. They already have beer flavors in them, but it can be something as simple as saying, "Wow, you know, I I really liked." Recently, I did a hoppy stout. I had uh, Goose Island did a beer called Night Stalker mm-hmm. years ago. Um, this is essentially the base beer for Bourbon County Stout, so a big roasty stout. But instead of aging in barrels, they dry hopped it with uh, Simcoe. And it was just this really terrific, piney, fruity flavor with the roast. It wasn't something I'd thought of. Um, and so I did something similar. But I didn't want it to be an 11% beer. I wanted something I could put on tap, so I did a 5% beer. So I did a 5% oatmeal stout. And the, the recipe really bears no resemblance to the ingredients that Goose Island posts online for Bourbon County. But that, that nugget of an idea came from one of their beers. It's not a clone. It's sort of my own reconceptualization of that style um in the same way blending beers can be a really terrific way to learn things um whether you've got beer on tap it's easy to go down the line and say well you know i've got this ipa and i've got this stout what happens if i add you know two-thirds ipa one-third stout you know well that's that's too hoppy and the roast doesn't come through what about one-third stout uh, or two-thirds stout one-third ipa and working through different flavor combinations like that even you know you open a bottle of uh, sour beer, and it's too sour. Hey, well, luckily you've got a saison on tap, and you add a little bit of that, or you open a bottle of saison if you don't keg, um, and just playing with those flavors and figuring out not only um, how to temper flavors, but what maybe seemingly uh, 
unique or uh, incongruous flavors might piece together and make something really delicious and interesting. Um, so those are sort of the more common places. For sort of my weirder beers, I'm often looking at maybe other foods and beverages. Um, I recently did a Saison that had a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc wine from New Zealand added to the keg, um, along with a bunch of uh, New Zealand hops. So I did New Zealand hops, New Zealand wine. It was sort of a play on uh, terroir. For whatever reason, a lot of the, the wine grapes and a lot of the hops from New Zealand have very similar flavors these um, people say gooseberry, people say cat pea, people say uh, grapefruit zest, sort of big, bright, bold flavors. I want to see how combining those flavors would go. Um, speaking of weird flavor combinations, there's a great book, uh, The Flavor Bible. Um, and this is a book, essentially, it's just this nice, big, long book where you can look up any of hundreds of different ingredients. I've not had that one. Is it's, it a it's beer great. book or is it no, a, it's, just it's a, a flavor book? It, exactly. It's, just, it's mostly a cooking book. Um, but if you look up um, chocolate, it's going to say, you know, it'll have the obvious things like coffee and caramel, but it's going and, and it's going to have a bunch of things that sort of probably don't work in beer, you know, cream and, uh, you know, salt or something like that. But then it's going to have maybe some more interesting flavors, um, hazelnut or uh, red chili or those sorts of things. And going through there, and what you can do, even if you don't want to use chocolate, you could look up um, ingredients that are have flavors reminiscent. So say you're brewing a Berliner Weiss, you could look up lemon and see what flavors might go with lemon. And, and one of those might really spark your interest. And then either you can go and, you know, make five gallons and add that straight away, or you can take a glass and make a, a little tea with the flavor or make an alcohol tincture and add that and dose it in and see if maybe those flavors work well. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a homebrew. You could buy a commercial beer, buy a commercial IPA and juice a little mango and, and put that into the, or buy mango juice and add that to the commercial IPA and go, is a mango IPA something I'd be interested in? I mean, obviously adding fresh fruit juice is going to be different than um, adding fruit fruit puree or something to the beer directly, I'm letting it ferment out and age and whatever. But it's going to give you a really interesting and and good insight onto whether this flavor is, has legs or whether it's something that hey, it was a fun idea, but this really probably isn't something I'm interested in. Well, in the interest of time, let's move on to uh, to secret number three. I think we've got uh, about a dozen to go through. <laughs> so let's. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, but sorry. I, no, I just, it's all it's, good. This this is something I'm just so I'm so passionate about people brewing better beer, and and so I don't have to drink bad beer as a beer judge or at a homebrew club meeting. <laughs> um, so this is, t and this is something that's really tough for homebrewers, I think, but focusing on a very limited set of styles, recipes. You know, I'm not talking about just brewing, say, IPAs, but how about just focusing on hoppy beers or just p focusing on. Um, dark, strong um, ales, something like that, just brewing lagers, just brewing sour beers. Um, and a lot of this is, you know, you look at a lot of those big, classic, terrific um, European breweries, someplace like uh, Cantillon that just brews Lambic, essentially. They brew a couple things which are sort of borderline, maybe not technically Lambic, but still barrel-aged sour beers. Um, and the reason they became Cantillon is that they have done this same thing over and over and over and over again for... Um, you know, in some cases, hundreds of years, or, or at least, you know, for the brewer for, for decades, until they've really mastered it. Um, I think so many home brewers and, and so many uh, American breweries want to brew everything. And yeah. that's, that's terrific. That's, that's a lot of fun. I certainly brew that way uh, a lot of time. But the problem is that you, you're not going to learn as much. You're not going to, to master something in the same way as if you focused on one particular subset. You don't have I, I know to do when this. I when I started brewing I I was brewing a different beer every time. Well, and I, I think basically never brewed the same beer twice. I, I think there's actually early on I think that really is the way to start out cuz you learn different ingredients and different um, styles and and maybe you and and you really want to develop a, a wide swath of skills. I often refer to these things as you know having having another arrow for my quiver. Um, you know, for example, uh, Hair of the Dog, I, I picked up a really terrific tip from them for uh, some of their bigger, darker, stronger beers, which is mostly what they brew, um, like Adam, which is a weird German smoked doppelbocky ale thing. Um, they collect uh, less wort than you normally would, and they boil down below their target volume, and then they top back up. So you're concentrating the sugars and the proteins, and you're accelerating all those Maillard reactions, and then you're topping up. So that's so just, almost like brewing an extract, then. 
Exactly. Almost, almost like doing a, a partial boil or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they get color and flavor development. And it, it really, to me, makes a, a great uh, impact on the beer. So, for example, if normally I was doing a five-gallon batch, um, I might boil you know, down from seven gallons to five and a half and leave half a gallon of trub mm-hmm. behind. They're collecting, you know, and obviously a lot more work, but as a home brewer, maybe you're only collecting five and a half or six gallons and you're boiling for two and a half or three hours down to three and a half or four gallons and then adding water after the boil uh, to get back up. So it's just another tip, another technique, another thing you can pick up that maybe that wasn't, you know, the the recipe it was ideal in, but then I used it in another barley wine and, you know, it worked perfectly for me. Um and so I would just say, you know, start out, you know, broad, figure out what you can brew well, figure out what you want to brew, figure out what you're interested in. But if you really want to be terrific at something, you don't have to focus on something for your whole home brewing career, but maybe take a year and say, hey, you know, 2015 is the year that I'm going to nail IPA or I'm going to nail hoppy beers. And jump around, you know, do pale ales, do IPAs, do double IPAs, do a hoppy barley wine, throw in a white IPA or a, a Belgian IPA or a black IPA. You like and IPAs, do- don't you? Well, if if that's the style you want to focus on, if you want to focus on Trappist ales, you know, brew brew uh, a double, a triple, a quad, and just keep cycling through and repitching the yeast from one to another, and try different yeast strains, and try different candy syrups, and try different pale malt brands, and you know, try try it without uh, crystal malt, and try it with only crystal malt and no candy sugar. You know, just really tease out the difference and figure out. And there's no right answer. It's figuring out what works for your palate and the ingredients that are available for you. Uh, let's go on to secret number four. Secret number four. Like four or five? Yeah, no, I think we're still on four. Um, this is this is a tricky one. Um, so modern times, we we are uh, our founder Jacob McKean, who who you interviewed with me a couple years ago, is a vegan, and all our beers are vegan. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there are a lot of breweries that focus on organic or focus on only using local ingredients or only mm-hmm. hops they grow. And as a business and, and as a, a, a producer, that, that is a completely legitimate way to go. The problem is in some cases, and luckily for vegan, there really aren't a lot of non-vegan you know, recipes. You know, we can't use lactose. We can't fine with gelatin, but we can't make bacon. Not a lot of meat in my beer, no. Exactly. Um, but for something like local hops, I've... I, I, as you do live in the mid-Atlantic, I have not been wowed by either the hops I've grown or the local hops I've purchased. And so if you want to use local hops, that's fine, but you probably aren't going to be able to brew a terrific IPA. unless you, you got to go a little Yakima. farther north, I don't know. Exactly. My, my hops grow fine, but they're not <laughs> terrific. Um, and so I think to be a terrific brewery, you have to get your maybe personal views out of the way at least a little bit um, and be able to recognize that, hey, I will certainly use local ingredients when I can and when their quality is high enough, but I'm not going to blindly use organic malts if I can't get a really terrific organic roasted barley because there aren't a lot of choices. Um, I think for a lot of homebrewers, we talk about malts often as if they're just a commodity. You know, I'm, I'm using chocolate malt in this. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you talk to commercial brewers, they are very precise on, I really like Brees chocolate malt in my, my porter, and I really like uh, Mutton's chocolate malt in my brown ale because it has mm-hmm. a mellower flavor. I'm, I'm just making that up at the moment, but really try to evaluate very specifically the different ingredients you use. Just because you can get your hands on citra hops doesn't mean they're going to be terrific citra hops. Um, a lot of commercial brewers go up to the Yakima Valley and actually pick out the lots, the lots of hops that they want to purchase. It'd be like yeah. uh, making mixed drinks with different kinds of alcohol, right? Exactly, and, and when even this is more like uh, you know going different to kinds par- of gin or different kinds of whiskey, right? Exactly, but even then, like sort of even even worse than that, it's like going to a farmer's market and there's eight different stands selling yellow peaches. And ideally, you'd want to go around to each one and taste all the yellow peaches and then go, okay, these are my favorites because they, they had just the right amount of shade or they were just, you know, this is a different, you know, um, growing conditions or that farm left them on the vine a little bit longer or, or any of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and as the big brewers get bigger, so people like Sierra Nevada, people like Sam Adams, people like Bells are starting to work with uh, the, the hop farmers in a lot of cases and say, hey, you know, we realize that the alpha acid content's going to go down if you leave them on the, the bind a little bit longer, but that really brings out the particular hop aroma we're looking for. We'll buy your whole crop if you do that for us, and we'll pay you a little extra on top of that. 
Um, and so that's sort of a disadvantage we're at as homebrewers is, you know, you, you go to the homebrew store, you buy a, a packet of hops, but, you know, really evaluate those hops, cut open the, the package, give them a good smell. If they don't smell really terrific, they're not going to make a beer that smells really terrific. Makes sense. Uh, well, let's go on to the next point. I think we're at five. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is sort of actually just coincidentally what we were talking about is, is really being very precise in your evaluation of ingredient quality. Um, I get a lot of emails from people who say, oh, I, I just got this, you know, this bourbon barrel, you know, what should I do with it? How should I store it? Um, something like that. It's, it, it can seem like a once in a lifetime opportunity to get a barrel or to, you know, buy a pound of, uh, of, of a terrific hop or something like that. But just getting a bourbon barrel may not be good enough. I mean, a lot of breweries are, you know, going and smelling each individual barrel. They, you know, know what beer is going to go in there, so they have a beer ready to go. Um, you know, they have a very particular taste in exactly which hops that they want. Not Cascades, but these particular Cascades. Um, there's a very weird and, to me, sort of unusual story in Stan Hieronymus's Hops book where he profiled a brewery that um, tasted, was went to Yakima and was tasting hop or smelling uh, hop rice. And they had, you know, I think it was the best cascades that ever smelled, but they, they recognized that those cascades would change the character of their normal pale ale and so passed on them and, and got some sort of blander cascades. <laughs> and to me, that always, that bothers me as a home brewer because I would want to have the best cascades. And, and so what if the beer is a little bit more citrusy, a little bit more aromatic? Um, but a lot of commercial breweries aren't necessarily trying to brew the best beer. They're trying to brew very consistent beer. So if you well, have, yeah, they want it to be the same, right? Exactly. And, and, but that's sort of, you know, one thing that, you know, I, I didn't really write about in this post, but for a commercial brewery, it's very hard to be the best if you're really concerned about, you know, brewing exactly the same beer every time, or you're worried about, you know, well, if, if we do that, we couldn't make enough to, to feed all of our markets or the, the cost would go up or all those sorts of things. Um, I think one of the great things about being a home brewer is that you don't have to worry about all those things. You can really focus on beer quality above all if that's what you want. Well, let's, uh, let's look at tip number six. pH is a, is, a, is a tricky area. I think it's one of the sort of more technically nebulous areas because there aren't a lot of necessarily right and wrong answers. Um, there's certainly, I think we all know, you know, there's sort of a general range, you know, 5.2 to 5.6 for the mash pH. Yeah, you're talking about mash pH. You, you just started, started with pH, so I thought. I'd- oh, yeah. So, I mean, mash, mash pH to me is the beginning of it. But that's, I think that's for a lot of uh, homebrewers, that's the end. If you hit your mash pH or you add your uh, 5.2 pH stabilizer, that's the last time you mm-hmm. take a pH reading or think about pH. And a lot of really terrific breweries, uh, I know Hill Farmstead is measuring the pH repeatedly during their process. They have a target for the beginning of the mash. They have a, pro- uh, a target for the beginning of the boil. They have a target for the middle of the boil. They have a target for the, uh, the pre-fermentation wort. They have a target for the post-fermentation uh, beer. Wow. Um, and those things, and they they have learned for their beers exactly where they want it, where it gets the best results. Um, so mash pH really helps uh, reduce tannin extraction. You might acidify the spargeoir to reduce um, tannins. Uh, you could uh, change the boil pH uh, impacts whether or not you're going to get um, a harsh or a soft bitterness. It's going to change the coagulation of the proteins. Um, pre-boil fermentation uh, pH I'm sorry, pre-fermentation pH uh, is going to impact which microbes are most active. That's really more for sour beers where you're trying to control the mix of lactobacillus and pediococcus and uh, brewer's yeast. Um, and then post-boil or post-fermentation is really a uh, flavor. And so you could even have a beer that, you know, has, you know, you want to add, uh, say, a stout, you need to add um, carbonate to it in the form of baking soda or chalk or slaked lime to get the pH to be up for the, the mash. And then you're going to acidify for the sparge. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to acidify more in the boil. And then maybe at the end, like we, we had a batch of Black House, our coffee stat at Modern Times, where the final pH was too low. And we ended up adding uh, some, uh, some baking soda back to the bright tank. To sort of cut when stouts get the pH gets too low, they get really acrid and burnt and mm-hmm. harsh, um, and so manipulating the pH at that point can really change the balance of of the beer. And so that's something I I would say, and that's something that really comes in once you sort of focus on something. You really learn your IPAs and you learn where you know your your local water and how to treat it to get your beers to taste the way you want them to. Good. 
Um, well, let's move on to the seventh tip. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of home brewers and a lot of commercial breweries dump really bad beer. If you have a beer that, you know, we were talking the off flavors for BJCP, if it tastes like uh, butter, you know, rancid butter, or if it tastes like green apples, or if uh, you clearly have... Uh, I just let it microbes. sit longer if it's bad. And that's that's certainly an option. <laughs> some, of, some of them get better with age. Now, okay. some of them don't, but... And it's certainly it's learning which off flavors, you know, hey, you've got, I just, I got an email from someone who had an Imperial Stout they brewed a week ago that wasn't tasting real great, and he was wondering if he should dump it. No, it's it's a week old Imperial Stout, give it some time. Um, but you have to learn, you know. Two weeks flavors, at least, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, which, which flavors are worth fighting for and, and maybe could be fixed and adjusted, and which ones are just not worth it. Um, I think it's important to to sort of realize that when you drink beers at a great brewery, you're tasting their highlight reel. They're not only dumping beers that are really off. They're dumping beers that are, well, just not not real great. Man, that hop, that batch of hops, you know, smelled fine uh, when we rubbed them, but when we dry I, hopped them with, they became real oniony. I don't something. know about that because I've had some bad ones at uh, various breweries too. Hmm. Oh, there, oh, and that's and that's part of. There are a lot of. I would say mediocre breweries that are willing to serve anything that's saleable. Um, that are willing to say, well, you know, it's not, it's not too bad. It's, it's okay. Um, and they're willing to sell it. But to me, the very best breweries generally are willing to say, you know, no matter how much money went into the beer, it's not worth our reputation. It's not worth, you know, sullying, um, you know, what, what we've worked so hard for. Um, and as a home brewer, you taste all of your beers. You taste the bad beers and the good beers. In my case, I'm always giving away the good beers, so I'm, luck I'm left with the, the more mediocre beers, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, that happens in my house, too. Exactly. And, but the, you know, not to judge yourself too harshly. That, you know, the best brewers, they make mistakes, too. They, they have batches that aren't great. But the way they build their reputation is by valuing the quality of their product above how much money they could make this month. That, you know, having a great reputation in the long term is going to really help you, is going to feed demand, and is going to keep people buying their, your beer. And when now, and we have, you know, what, 3,000 breweries in this country, if, mm -hmm. if you keep putting out bad beer, people are going to go on Beer Advocate, they're going to go on Rape Beer, they're going to go on Untapped, and they're going to learn about it, and they're going to avoid your beer. Not everyone, but I mean, a, a, you're going to lose market share by, you know, repeatedly serving suboptimal beer. Um, and just as a homebrewer, learning that, you know, if you want to build a great reputation with, you know, other homebrewers, people in your homebrewing club, you know, really learn to critically evaluate your beers and then serve the best ones at, you know, the the, the homebrew club or enter them in competitions or those sorts of things. Be be an editor, you know. A great writers write a lot, but don't publish everything. <laughs> well, I think, or they become bloggers, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's, I blog too, so. Uh, let's. I think we're at number eight now. Let's look at number eight. Um, yeah, and this this is one that maybe a little more debatable than some of them. Um, but going with sort of focusing on styles, I'd suggest focusing on a yeast strain. And again, don't start out right you know right out of the gate and and pick the first yeast strain uh, that you've you've bumped into. But if you really want to brew um, you know terrific Belgian beers, I, I would suggest not having a different yeast strain for your double, a different yeast strain for your triple, a different one for your blonde, a different one for your wit, a different – you know, really find a couple of yeast strains that you really want, that you like, that you like their flavor, but that you really want to learn the ins and outs of. You want to learn how the pitching rate, how the oxygen level, how the pitching temperature, how the fermentation temperature – how, what those profiles look like, um, you know, how how you, do you need to rouse the yeast? Do you need to give it more nutrient? Do you need to hold it at a high temperature to ensure it finishes out? Do you need to blend yeast strains in certain uh, conditions? And those are all sort of things you only learn firsthand to me. You, know, you can certainly get tips. You can certainly read reviews and, you know, suggestions. But you really, to become um, a master of a particular yeast strain, you really need to use it repeatedly in different conditions and learn – how those different things affect the the flavors you get out of it, the attenuation, um, all those things, um, and this this could certainly be. I mean, for a lot of commercial breweries, this is a yeast strain that they have in house that either they got from a particular yeast lab or that they isolated, um, or or had a lab isolate for them and then bank for them. You know, maybe it's something that they just reused a commercial strain over and over and over again until it adapted, and then they had it banked. Um, a home brewer could certainly do that, but I think you're just as well off. There's, again, so many uh, options now, and 
I mean, White Labs and Y Yeast are each releasing, you know, special new strains every couple of months. And if you like one of those, you might want to go to the effort of yeah, plating it and banging it. They do have a nice selection, don't they? They do. It's terrific. And, and not only that, but now we have places like the Yeast Bay and East Coast Yeast and South Yeast and Omega Yeast and uh, Giga Yeast and all the dry yeast manufacturers. And there are, there are literally hundreds of yeast strains and dozens of yeast labs. Um, and, you know, you can really find a terrific strain that exactly suits mm -hmm. what you want. But you might not notice it the first time. You, you know, I often try to brew with a strain a couple of times, either repitching it or saving some of the starter and growing it back up again, to try a couple of different situations to see if, um, you know, what what it responds well to, and then hopefully, and I, I honestly haven't been as good at this as I should have, but you know, figuring out at the very least, you know, hey, what what do you like for American beers? What do you like for English beers? What do you like for lagers? What do you like for Hefeweizens? What do you like for Belgian beers? As a jumping off point. Um, you know, that by default, you know, I, I love uh, White Labs 530 uh, Trappist Ale for, for my sort of regular Belgians. I think it just has a great balance of uh, spicy and fruity flavors. But I've also learned that if you let the fermentation sort of sag down below 70 towards the end of fermentation, it will go to sleep. It won't finish out the fermentation. It's almost impossible to get going again. So I've learned to start it cool and then make sure it sort of finishes on the high end up in the low 70s. Um, I think that's sort of the key is, you know, I'm, that's just sort of my basic take on that strain. Um, you know, and, and certainly other people are going to have other opinions that might be related to how much I pitch or my oxygen levels or the sorts of beers I'm using it in or, or anything like that. So, um, you know, don't, don't feel that there's a single right answer, you know, figure out what works for you. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at tip number nine. So adjusting finished beer flavors, um, I'm not talking about in this case, oh, you know, that wheat beer kind of tastes weird enough. I'm going to dump some raspberry extract and some uh, cinnamon in there. That's fine. If I mean, that's that's something a lot of uh, lower quality breweries do to make beer saleable. It's not going to be a great beer, but, you know, you're going to cover up the off flavor and you're going to make back the $10,000 that you need to on that batch to, to stay open and, you know, pay the salaries. And it's fine as a home brewer if you if you want to do that and you want to you know unload that beer on unsus unsuspecting family members at barbecue, fine. It's very rare that you're going to make a really terrific beer by sort of covering up off flavors <laughs> or um, doing something like that. What I'm really talking about is really fine granular adjustments. So, um, like a lot of water salts, if you want to add calcium chloride or calcium sulfate, you can do that to the finished beer. You can dissolve them in a little water. Mm -hmm. You can pull yourself a sample, dose that taste it with various different mineral levels and figure out exactly what level benefits that beer. Um, yeah, you, and then maybe next time you do that from the start, but you know, sort of starting with a, with a softer water and then building. Yeah. You also talked about maybe using, um, uh, adjusting the mash pH at the very end, or, I'm sorry, the beer pH at the very yeah, end. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, e either, I mean, with, with sour beers, a lot of breweries will actually have an acid beer that they hang on to. It's a particularly sour batch or they brew mm -hmm. it to be very sour and they'll, Dose it in, you know, hit the pH they want. But even for clean beers, um, something like a Saison, something like a Blonde, that, you know, it, just a little tartness, it, it's not going to come across as sour. It's not going to read tart. It's just going to be crisp. It's going to be brighter and livelier and more, you know, refreshing, those sorts of things. Um, it, it doesn't take a lot. You know, maybe the pH uh, for that batch naturally was 4.3 or 4.4 and bring it down to 4.2 or 4.1 is going to be enough to really make those flavors uh, jump out at you. Fruit beers in particular, I think a little extra acidity if you're doing a, a mm -hmm. wheat beer with cherries. I mean, fruit is naturally, you know, tart and sweet. And when you ferment beer, you know, with fruit, you, you lose the sweetness because it ferments out and you lose the tartness because it gets canceled out by the beer. And adding... Mm -hmm. <coughs> And adding those flavors, you know, back to it, whether, you know, it's, it's uh, someplace like New Glarus that adds some sweetness to their, their fruit beers, or whether it's someplace that adds a little bit of a C to their fruit beers, um, I think it really helps to make those flavors um, taste fruitier, to taste, you know, brighter mm -hmm. and more refreshing. Well, let's, uh, let's look at tip number 10, I think we're at now. Yeah, this is uh, I, certainly something I was really negligent on uh, for years, uh, reducing oxidation as much as you can. Um, and, you know, you can be as careful as you want, you know, racking from uh, the fermenter to a bottling bucket and from the, you know, using the, the spigot to go from the bottling bucket to the bottles. You're going to introduce a lot of oxygen. 
Um, and luckily, as home brewers, your bottle conditioning in a lot of cases, the yeast is going to scavenge a lot of that oxygen. It's not going to do a perfect job. Um, the more you can purge things with CO2, the smoother your process is, the better. Um, I really don't think I brewed terrific IPAs. I brewed very good IPAs. I didn't brew terrific IPAs until I started kegging. Because when you keg, you can purge the, the, the keg with CO2. You can. I, I put my racking cane into the keg and I'll pump it a couple of times, my auto siphon to purge the line with CO2. Well, you got to be careful of the auto siphon too. I've had those leak oxygen as well. Exactly. You see those bubbles come in? I replace yeah. my auto siphon probably once every year or 18 months when they start getting a little wonky. Um, I, know, I know a lot of people have stopped doing secondaries now too. Yeah, no, I, I think in most cases, the secondary is just is just an opportunity to get oxygen and wild microbes into your beer. Um, sure, if you're if you're aging something for a long time, you know more power to you. If, even for IPAs now, when I dry hop them, I'll dry hop while fermentation's still going on, um, just to have that yeast active so it can scavenge any oxygen, so it can um, you know the you've got enzymes working that'll convert some of those hop compounds to more interesting flavors, and then I'll generally do another hop addition in the keg. So I'll put the hops into a bag, into the keg with some marbles. Then I'll purge it to get all the, the oxygen, all the air out that's between the hops and in the hops. Then rack the beer on top, close the keg up again, purge with more CO2 a couple of times, and then get it cold and get it on tap as fast as possible. Um, and as homebrewers, we're at this big advantage. You know, we're not sending beer out to a distributor who's then trucking it across the country in a warm truck, and then it's sitting in a distributor's warehouse, and then it's sitting at your local beer store, and it's getting pulled in and out of things. It's getting warm and hot. And we have- yeah, as, I, as I've started traveling more, a lot, a lot of countries don't have a lot of refrigeration either. Oh, exactly. So, I mean, the beer might be unrefrigerated for months before it gets served. And that's and for a lot of those breweries, I mean, it, it it's a big deal if you can get another two or three weeks out of a batch. And you know, that's that much more beer that makes it to the consumer in good shape and that doesn't get sent back. And um, but as home brewers, I mean, you you know, take every opportunity you can to you know store your beer cold to um, you know reduce the oxygen contact as much as possible. All those sorts of things I, I think are hugely important. Well, I think we're up to tip number eleven now. Yeah, and this certainly goes along with this, serving your beer when it's at its, its peak. Um, and this is a very different answer for very different kinds of beer. Uh, for an IPA, I mean, I think my IPAs, four to five weeks after I brewed them is is when they're at their peak. If if it's not gone by about two months from brew day, I'm not loving it. Um, and so a lot of that comes down to knowing how much to brew. Um, if you, Even if you've got a big system, you might not want to brew 15 gallons of double IPA unless you're going to be able to you know, you're throwing a party or you really, really, really don't have a job and love drinking double Maybe you IPA. just really like double IPA, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just sort of knowing how much of a beer you can brew that will be consumed in the correct amount of time. And then conversely, I always have a bad habit of every time people come over, every time I'm going to a homebrew club meeting, I go, oh, you know, what did I brew recently? What did I just put on tap that I should bring? And often those things aren't ready yet. You know, you've you've got a big stout, or you've got sour beer, and it's it's you know it's it's okay, but you know honestly, well, six months from now it's going to be terrific. Different beers hit their peak <laughs> at different times, vastly different times. Yeah, know. and so taking notes, I think, is so important. If you're focusing on a beer, rebrewing it and and drinking it, you know, over the course of a couple of months, and taking notes and tasting it, and going, okay, you know, this beer was really terrific. It was it was good at two months. It was great at three months. It was the best at four months. At five months, it was still pretty good. At six months, well, you know, it, it was all right. At seven months, I should might as well dump it. Um, and so really learning your beers, when your beers are at their best, I think is really um, essential. For commercial breweries, I always feel like it's this feedback loop where um, a brewery that makes a great IPA, let's look, let's look at the Alchemist Heady Topper, something mm -hmm. like that. It's so popular, people love it so much that it flies off the shelf. It's a hoppy beer. It's great fresh. This is perfect. That beer doesn't sit around. No one has a six-month-old can of you know hay topper they found on a shelf, and that's what often happens. To, you know, you you get a, a wit beer from Belgium. It's been sitting on the shelf. You drink it. There's no date label on it. You have no idea how old it is. You taste it. It's lousy. That beer was probably delicious a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being. I was outraged. I I did a, a, a brew Pilsner or Kell homebrew contest. And I, I brewed, you know, a triple decocted, all uh, floor malted, bohemian malt, uh, saws hops, 
soft water I made up from distilled. And I, I went to the local supermarket. I just happened to see they had Pilsner Arkell on sale uh, for, you know, eight bucks a six pack or whatever it was. And it said on it, uh, best buy uh, five months from now. I went, this is, how could my luck be any better? Five months from now, I bet this is a six month best buy. Um, you know, I, I got a month old from the Czech Republic. Awesome. This is going to be terrific. I take it home, pour a glass. I pour my pills and I drink mine, bright, fresh, hoppy, delicious, smooth. I drink that. It tastes like white cardboard. I go, wow, you know, what? Oh, you know, sure, they have green balls. It didn't really taste skunk, though. Um, and so I went online. I was, I was reading up on an old Brewing Techniques article on Pilsner and Kell, and they said that they put a year best buy on it. The idea that you put a year best buy on a 5% Pilsner to me is just, you know, that's being shipped across the world. But, you know, they don't want the beer, you know, they, people look at those dates as, you know, expiring milk or something like that and, and don't want to buy it. And I, it just, it kills me when, when a brewery puts that sort of level of marketing and sales above beer quality. That, I, that I, never happens. And, and I, from everything I've heard, if you go to the Pilsner Raquel Brewery in the Czech Republic and you have the beer that they have there that is unfiltered. I bet it's very good, right? It's, it's apparently, you know, sort of an a, a amazing experience and the beer is fantastic. And, but the stuff you get that's, you know, filtered and pasteurized and sits at Safeway for seven months for some reason isn't terrific. Well, a lot of the exports don't really match the, the, the homegrown yeah. either, you know. So sadly, and I, I, I think um, you know America really is the the best place to be drinking beer these days. You know, being able to go to a go to a brewery that specializes. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, and Jack's Abbey is up there, and all they do is lagers, and they do you know everything from you know sort of the classics. They they do a Marzen, they do a Pilsner, but then they do you know a, a big uh, Imperial Pale Lager. It's an IPA with lager yeast. They do a Berliner Weiss with lager yeast. They do. You know, a bunch of big Baltic porters with um, coconut and vanilla and bourbon barrel aging, and you know they've really picked a niche and they've they've really gone after it. Well, uh, let's move on. I think we're on to the last one. It's uh, number twelve. Yeah, this one this one kills me. Um, I I hate to admit it. I'm I'm a, I'm an economist. I'm a, I'm a practical guy. I would I would like to think that marketing is completely useless. I'd like to think that if I was served a beer in an ugly glass from a from a misshapen bottle with no label on it and it was fantastic that I would recognize that. And I might, but I there's another level where you are able to convince people through the way you talk about the beer, from the way you present the beer that raises it. It's not going to make a terrible beer delicious, it's not going to make a delicious beer terrible, but it's going to give you a little extra. Um, so for home brewers, my a pet peeve of mine, please take the labels off of your bottles. Please take the <laughs> gross, half-detached, Bell's two-hearted label, soak in some OxyClean before before you're you're gonna bottle in it. Get that label off, scrub it off with a little steel wool. You don't have to do anything other than that. That's sort of the minimum. You don't to me, it always says if you don't put any effort into the presentation of the beer, how much effort did you put into those little details, into that little, you know, um, checking the pH or or making sure something was purged twice instead of just once with CO two or or something yeah, like that. I think Charlie Bamforth did this, uh, talked about this test he did one time where he took a uh, took stale beers and put them on a brand name mat. Yeah, and then took three fresh, really delicious beers and put them on a non-brand name mat, and had people come in and test them. Of course, they rated the brand name higher. <laughs> yeah, no, and 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 I'm sure even though the beer was much worse, particularly when you look at these beers that have terrific online ratings, I think some of that is always a brewery has a particular reputation. Um, it's and as a home brewer, I mean, I think you can really leverage that. Learn to talk about your beers in the right way. Instead of just saying, oh, here's the pale ale I brewed, you know, talk about, you know, what flavors were you trying to get? I was really trying to get, you know, on the toastier end of the scale uh, for an American pale ale, but balance that with big citrus and big tropical fruits from Citra and Amarillo hops and, you know, really bring someone into, you know, entice them and not just say, well, you know, I am not so happy with it. Oh, you know, it's it's this or that, or I get some diacetyl. You know, don't, don't tell people negative things about your beer. You know, don't, don't sell yourself short, you know, 
give it a good presentation. And if they say, you know, hey, I get a little buttery, go, yeah, you know, I taste that too. You know, I, I think, you know, I probably ferment it a little bit too warm or whatever. But, you know, don't, don't prime people with uh, negative expectations. It's popcorn beer. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, if you want to make labels or you want to, you know, dip the neck in wax or you want to cork your, your bottles instead of, um, you know, putting a, putting a crown cap on them, particularly for special batches or something you're giving mm-hmm. as a present, I think that really elevates home brewing. I mean, I think that's what we're all interested in. We, we don't want to be seen as a hobby of people trying to make cheap booze. We want to be, you know, seen, uh, seen like people who bake bread or, People who uh, you know love barbecue or any, anything like that, you know, you want to be seen as being serious about your hobby, being serious about what you're doing, Absolutely. and um, make making the best possible product. And and obviously, I don't follow these all twelve of these tips. And this is to me, you know, it takes a different level of commitment. I love brewing weird, interesting, you know, one one shot kind of things. I, I'm drinking a a quote unquote IPA at the moment that has no hops in it. That's all spruce and, and grapefruit zest. It's not really <laughs> terrific. One, one of my good friends uh, commented, it tastes a little like, uh, like uh, natural uh, counter cleaner or something like that. Yeah. I'm it's, not a big fan of spruce beer myself. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's weird. I mean, I'm not, you don't want to get to a point where all you're brewing is the same exact beer, the same recipe over and over and over again and attempt to make there, it. Is this the one right here on the front of your page? Spruce it is. Fruit <coughs> India Pale Ale Groot? It is, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I just posted that earlier tonight. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the tricky thing is, you know, you sort of want to leave some space open for experimentation. So generally what I find myself doing is I, I have a few styles that are my favorites. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. sour beers, if, if you can guess, and hoppy beers. Um, but then I try to pepper in other things to keep me interested. You know, I don't want to have the same beers on tap over and over and over again. Um, so I want to have I, I thought you that, just brewed sour beers, right? Yeah. No, luckily, and I'm actually surprised this with no hops and the lack of preservative powers. I was uh, pleasantly pleased I was able to brew this without any acidity. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, find, find uh, what you want to be as a home brewer. Just, you know, consider these uh, tips as things that, you know, to either appreciate you don't have to do if you don't want to be uh, a world-class brewery or, or maybe a few that you might pick up to improve your beer without uh, making this into a hobby that's more work than fun. Well, thanks for sharing those tips with us, Michael. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, it's, it's always a pleasure to be on, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll be talking to you again at some point in the future. Thank you again. Uh, appreciate you being on the show, Michael. My pleasure as always. Again, my guest was uh, Michael Tonsmeyer. He's the author of the recent book, uh, American Sour Beers from Brewers Publications. You can also find Michael on his blog, which is themadfermentationist.com. Well, thank you to Michael Tonsmeyer for joining me today. And thanks to our sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, now offering six issues a year and 15% off everything in their store. Head on over to beerandbrewing.com and use a new coupon code BEERSMITH2015 when you check out to get your discount on this great new brewing magazine. For regular listeners of the podcast, I remind you you can listen to all 95 episodes of the BEERSMITH podcast, streaming 24-7 at BEERSMITHRADIO.COM. That's BEERSMITH RADIO, streaming around the clock at BEERSMITHRADIO.COM. Finally, thank you for your continued support, and I wish you a happy new year, and hope you have... A great brewing week. Mm-hmm.